Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of the appeal process for Robert Sylvester Kelly and um, give some input of what is going on. I'm going to share with you today on the We Can Fly in July series um, a motion that was filed and denied. And then we're going to go deeper into the definition of the statute of limitation uh, according to the court system and how the processes actually work. So today is July the 5th and we have just gotten the court docket for the description of what Jennifer Bonjean has filed and on the see what date was this um she filed a motion on june 28th and this was right before the sentencing asking for you know to serve her the i guess statute of limitations that's going to be taking place in chicago she wanted to have some of the videos removed or something to that nature regarding the 2008 and prior to that because the statute of limitations has run out as well as um, him already having been found not guilty on that. So Judge Lewin Weber then did a, let me see, he did, he filed a motion on June 30th, um, the order for the reasons stated herein, defendant's motion is to dismiss and Kelly's motion to server are denied. See attachments order. Um, Harry Lewin Weber on 6-30-2022, he mailed the notice and entered it on the docket 6-30-2022. So you can go and Google or YouTube Whoever's reading the motions for that particular uh, filing, I don't want to read motions, okay? We already know what he's done. We know what the counts are. I will read the motion specifically for the sentencing, and that will be uh, coming up probably, I'm going to record it after this, but I wanted to get this out because this is the newest, most pertinent information. So over here I'm going to do this as a premiere and then on Sunday we are going to talk about what has been discussed in this podcast so Sunday will connect the podcast to this information so write down all of your questions that you may have so we can get right to the gist of everything so According to the Congressional Research Service, where they've been informing the legislative debate since 1914, they came up with a statute of limitations in federal criminal cases, and they provided us with an overview. So the overview is more or less going to share uh, what specialists say in American public law. And this is, uh, this was created November 14th, 2017. So I don't know if things have changed, but this is the newest statute of limitations overview that I was able to find. So a statute of limitations dictates the time period within which a legal proceeding has begun. So what does that mean? Um, that means that uh, the statute of limitations of 2008 was respected from the date of the not guilty verdict in 2008 for Robert Sylvester Kelly. So that's why Gen uh, Attorney Von Jean decided to write a sur um, statute of limitations dismissal on the things that were brought up from before. He's already been found not guilty. Um, a lot of people want to go back in there. Um, and then we're going to talk about in the next, uh, let me see, in the court proceedings of why 
you know, the statute of limitations are so important. And I may actually get that main document and read that off to you, what Bonjean has said. Um, let me see here. So, let me see here. All right. So basically, when was this? This here, okay. Let me try to get this all together here. Um, Okay, I guess it was docket 221, the main motion that Bonjean had filed for Robert on the 28th in the U.S. District Court of Northern District of Illinois in the Eastern Division, the United States of America versus uh, Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid, and Milton Brown, also known as June Brown. Okay, so... To give a little background, what they're trying to say. Okay, so Bonjean said that on February 13, 2020, the government filed a 13 court superseding indictment charging defendant with four child pornography counts, conspiracy to obstruct justice in connection with his 2008 state court acquittal, three counts related to receiving the affirmation uh, child pornography and five additional enticement counts. Counts one through nine of the indictment largely relate to con conduct directed at minor one, while counts 10 through 13 allege sexual abuse of four other minors, minors three through six. Discovery reveals that numerous other women have allegedly abused, um, have alleged abuse by defendant over the past 30 years. Some women claim to have been abused by defendant as a minor, um, while others claim defendant was abusive toward them when they were adults. Okay, so that's the background. Um, and so Bongina is saying, the court should preclude the government from introducing uncharged other bad act evidence. So he's already been found not guilty. So she's saying the government has produced a lot of discovery in this case, reflecting allegations by some women who have alleged that defendant mistreated them in some form or fashion over the past 30 years. Many of the allegations are unsupported by corroborated evidence, meaning that there is nothing to back this up. There is no evidence. The court must prevent defendant's trial from being engulfed by Irrelevant and excessive bad character evidence that adds little to the jury's assessment of whether defendant committed the charges offense. Defendant cannot be expected to defend against dozens of uncharged claims of abuse and sexual misbehavior, particularly where defendant must already uh, to defend against charges of sexual abuse by five different women decades after the conduct allegedly occurred. Unless this court servers counts 10 through 13 of the indictment from the remaining counts, the jury will hear extensive evidence relating to defendants' e, uh, alleged sexual conduct toward minor one and four other minors. As argued in this motion to server, defendant contends that the joinder of the counts pertain to minor one with the enticement court uh, counts related to minors three through six and is unduly prejudicial to the defendant, particularly where the evidence related to minors three through six is significantly weaker than the evidence related to minor one. Okay, so here's the legal standard. Generally, evidence of other acts is inadmissible to prove a person's character in order to show that on a particular occasion, a person acted in accordance with the character. There is, however, an exception to the general rule where the evidence is admitted to prove 
motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identify, absence of mistake, of lack of accident. The seventh court circuit reminded lower court courts that all evidentiary, evidentiary questions begin with rule 402, which contain the general principle that relevant evidence is admissible and irrelevant evidence is not. Rule 401 defines relevant evidence. Okay, so I'm not going to read the whole motion. <clears throat> so basically she's saying defendant moves to bar the following other bad act evidence, evidence related to the defendant's marriage and alleged sexual relationship with Le Aaliyah. Uncharged. Number two, uncharged allegation of women who claim that the defendant abused or mistreated them. Number three, evidence that defendant impregnated any accusers and or facilitated their abortions. Four, evidence that defendant infected any sexual partners with herpes. Five, <clears throat> evidence that defendant was previously sued by accusers and or settled lawsuits brought by those accusers. And six, video recordings of sexual acts that do not involve the charged conduct and seven prior convictions of defendant. So the conclusion that Bonjean wants Lewin Weber to understand before the Chicago trial is for the foregoing reasons defendant seeks an order from this court granting defendants motions in limine. So that means in lieu of or going forward. So Lewin Weber posts his motion on what day here so he orders description so june 30th he files a motion for the reasons stated herein defendant's motion to dismiss um and kelly's motion to server are denied and then he talks back he he talks back to why the statute of limitations um, has some type of order with it. And this is where we're going to take today's topic right now and go over the Congressional Research Service statute of limitations overview. So here's what the summary is. The statute of limitations dictates the time period within which a legal proceeding must begin. The purpose of a statute of limitations in a criminal case is to ensure that the prompt prosecution of the criminal charges and the, are thereby sparing the accused of the burden of having to defend against stale charges or outdated charges after memories have faded or evidence is lost. There is no statute of limitations for federal crimes punished by death, nor for certain federal crimes of terrorism or for certain federal sex offenses, prosecution for most other federal crimes must begin within five years of the commitment of the offense. There are exceptions. Some types of crimes are subject to a longer period of limitation. Some circumstances suspend or extend the otherwise applicable period of limitation. So they're using that statute to say that Lewin Weber has the right to open up the case because whatever his reasons are in his motion that he's filing against the um, the information that is going to be allowed in and admissible. So ordinarily the statute of limitations begin to run as soon as the crime has been completed. Although the federal crime of conspiracy is complete, when one of the plotters commits an affirmative act in its name. The period for co uh, conspiracies began with the last affirmative act committed in furtherance of the scheme. Other so-called continuing offenses include various possession crimes and some that impose continual obligations to register or report. So we're going to go a little bit further here and look at what really matters for um, Robert Sylvester Kelly and his statute of limitations. So you can understand a little bit about why the courts are doing it this way. 
So the free statute of limitations, according to the congressional research, says that the time period within which formal criminal charges must be brought after a crime has been committed. And um, they use the statute of limitations from the Black's Law Dictionary. The purpose of a statute of limitations is to limit exposure to the criminal prosecution to a certain fixed period of time following the occurrence of those acts the legislature has decided to punish by criminal sanctions. Such a limitation is designed to protect individuals from having to defend themselves against charges when the basic facts may have been obscured by the passage of time and to minimize the danger of official punishment because of acts in the far distant past. Such a time limit may also have the salutary effect of encouraging law enforcement officials promptly to investigate suspected criminal activity. Therefore, in most instances, prosecutions are barred if the defendant can show that there was no indictment or other formal charge filed within the time period dictated by the statute of limitations. So I don't know if uh, I don't believe he had any other, you know, situations that happened from 2008 until now, 2019. So the statute of limitations are creatures of statute. The common law recognized no period of limitation. An indictment could be brought at any time. Limitations are recognized today only to the extent that a statute or due process dictates their recognition. And that is, at some point, events pass into history and due process restricts the extent to which they may be resurrected to build a criminal accusation with or without an applicable state of limitations. And this is from the United States versus Marion, 404 U.S. 307.324 in 1971. So that's the footnote to that law that it... um it connects. So federal statutes of limitation are as old as federal crimes. When the founders assembled in the first Congress, they passed not only the first federal criminal laws, but made prosecution under those laws subject to specific statutes of limitation. And that is under footnote nine, except for murder and forgery, the statute of limitations for a prosecution of all federal capital offense were three. Okay, uh, let me see. It says continued. Let me see. Three. Three years. The statute of limitations for all non-capital crimes was two years. And this was a statute 119 in 1790. It was brought forth. So let me go back here. Um, <clears throat> let me see. So uh, federal capital offenses may be prosecuted at any time. <clears throat> so there was no federal capital offenses because that's murder. But unless some more specific arrangements has been made, a general five-year statute of limitations cover all other federal crimes. Some of the expectations for the general rule identify longer periods for particular crimes. Let's go to 12. So particular crimes in which they're talking is under the 18 U.S.C. Um, from the Supreme Court uh, rule number 3286. So we can look that up at another time. Others suspend or extend the applicable period under certain circumstances, such as flight of the accused or during time of war. That's it. That's it. Aside from capital offenses, crimes which Congress associated with terrorism. Okay, if the result ends in death or serious injury. Um, although the crimes were selected because they are often implicated as act of terrorism, a terrorist defendant is not a prerequisite to an unlimited period for prosecution. So that doesn't relate to him. Let's go to limits by crime. Although the majority of federal crimes are governed by the general five year statute of limitation, Congress has chosen longer periods for specific types of crime. 20 years for the theft of artwork, 10 years for arson, for certain crimes against financial institutions, 
and for immigration offenses in eight years for the nonviolent terrorist offense that may be prosecuted at any time if committed under violent circumstances, investigative difficulties or the seriousness of the crime. Some to have seem to have provided the rationale for enlargement of the time limit for prosecuting these offenses beyond the five year standard. Child protection. The child protection section permits an indictment indictment or information charging kidnapping, sexual abuse, physical abuse of a child under the age of 18 to be filed within, within the longer of 10 years or the life of the victim. Section 3283 extends the statute of limitations in sexual abuse cases generally and is not confined to the offenses found in sexual abuse chapter of the federal criminal code. In contrast, 18 U.S.C., uh, Supreme Court Rule 3299 eliminates the statute of limitations in child sexual abuse cases arising under the specific statutory provisions it cites. So again, you got to ask the question, you know, if this was, if this rule was in effect and he was found not guilty, Robert was found not guilty in 2008, then a lot of these statute areas does not apply to him particularly. So we're going to keep reading on. Um, let me see. Wartime. No, that's not him. Indictment or information. The statute of limitations runs until an indictment or information is found and returned to the court. There is, however, some questions about the impact of sealing the indictment upon its return. The federal rules of criminal procedure allow the magistrate to whom the indictment is returned to seal it until the defendant is apprehended or released on bail. Some courts seem troubled when they believe that the seal has been applied for purposes of tactical advantage rather than to prevent the escape of the accused. The statute of limitations remains told if the original indictment is replaced by a superseding indictment, okay, which is in this case, Robert Sylvester Kelly's superseding, superseding indictment. As long as the superseding indictment does not substantially alter the original charge. Um, if the defense, okay, let's go down to this footnote. Let me understand this 57 United States versus yielding 657, um, eighth circuit court in 2011 for limitations per processes, a superseding indictment foul while the original indictment is validating pending relates back to the time of filing of the original indictment. If it does not substantially broaden or amend the original charges. Okay. And this is where Lewin Weber feels that, um, opening it up to the statute of limitations and removing that, that, that lift for being able to go back and, you know, overreach back into the past to determine whether a superseding indictment substantially broadens or amends a pending timely indictment. We agree with other courts that it is appropriate to consider whether the additional pleadings alleged violations of a, diff a different statute contain different elements rather on different evidence or expose the defendant to a potentially greater sentence. The touchstone of this analysis is whether the original indictment provided the defendant with fair notice of the subsequent charges against him. So did they tell him in the sent or in the sentencing in 2008 that this is open for future if they had any type of laws that they quoted uh would it extend over into a continuance of the same type of crime 20 30 years later okay um so that's that's what I want you to understand as well. So let me go down here to um, conspiracies and continuing offenses. Statutes of limitations normally begin to run when the crime is complete, which occurs when the last element of the crime has been satisfied. So when they say complete, it means the, uh, let me see. Okay, they cite over 15 cases here. Um, for what it means complete, what the court means as complete, which occurs when the last element of the crime has been satisfied. 
So I guess when the sentencing has occurred and all and the court has, you know, decided that this is what it's going to be or, you know, a, an appeal has happened and they've gone through it and they've weeded everything out and then they say that this is the final rule. So I guess the final ruling, the rule for conspiracy is a bit different. The general conspiracy statute consists of two elements, an agreement to commit a federal crime or to defraud the United States and an overt act committed in furtherance of the agreement. Conspiracies left uninterrupted will frequently continue or through on through several overt acts to the ultimate commission of the underlying substantive offenses, which are the objectives of their plots. Thus, the statute of limitations for such conspiracies begin to run not for the first overt act committed in furtherance of the conspiracy, but with the last. So this is why I think Lewin Weber is saying, I'm not sure, I'm not an attorney on this, and I have not looked at all the connected um, uh, cases that aligns with it, because through those cases, there is one definite mandatory purpose for, you know, using those uh, case law for this particular thing. So again, I'm not an attorney. I'm just reading over what the Congressional um, Research Lab is saying about statute limitations. So you will have to go further or ask an attorney for more information. But I'm just reading this. The statute of limitations under conspiracy statutes that have no overt act requirement begins to run with the accomplishment of the conspiracy's objectives with abandonment or with the defendant's effective withdrawal from the conspiracy. So um, they're saying with the Mann Act, you know, this involves, let me see here. There are other crimes which like conspiracy continue on long after the elements necessary for their prosecution fall into place. The applicable statute of limitations for these continuing crimes is delayed if either the explicit language of the criminal statute compels a conclusion or or the nature of the crime involved is such that Congress must assuredly have intended that it be treated as the continuing one. Continuing federal offenses for purposes for statutes of limitations include escape from federal custody, flight to avoid prosecution, failure to report for sentencing, possession of the skill and skull of an endangered species, possession of counterfeit currency, uh, kidnapping, failure to register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, failure to register under the Selective Service Act, being found in the U.S., having re-entered this country after deportation, embezzlement under some circumstances, and possession of unregistered um pipe bombings. Well, you know, a lot of that can also be used for the fact that um, in his case, in his case, he did none of these things here. Um, okay, so the conspiracy claim is so much, it's so broad. And there was something I was going to say about um the failure to pay child support, they did get him on that. Um, Health care fraud, bank fraud, and um, there was a oh, failure to register. Now, according to the sentencing by Judge Ann Donnelly, her purpose, which we'll go over that soon, but her purpose has him registering for a lot of things. So he better organize his life during the time of uh, parole, probation, and he's going to be even older. So he may not be able to handle and do all those registries that he is required to do based on the sentencing requirements after being after serving his time or getting the appeal. With the fact that the appeal may grant him, you know, immunity or a new trial or something like that. 
because the sentencing is on the record, they may still use those areas to say that he must report, he must drop DNA, he must, um, you know, and all the other things they say in the sentencing report, which we'll go over that in a little bit. So let's talk about the constitutional considerations in the ex post facto. Historically, constitutional challenges to the application of various statutes of limitations have arisen most often under the ex post facto or due process clause. The Constitution prohibits both Congress and the states from enacting ex post facto law. So that's 114. Let me see what they're saying down here. 114. Um, I hope they explain it. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. No state shall pass any bill of attainder or ex post facto law. So it's after the fact of the law. So uh, this is where I'm confused because I would like to know how they would be able to open his statute of limitation up if the law states at this time under, but I guess I would have to go under the 2008 federal laws and actually read his um, entries in 2008 and determine how they, how they decided everything in his case. And right now I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to promise to do that. But <laughs> um, what it says is first, every law that makes an action done before the passing of a law and which was innocent when done, criminal and punishes such action. Every law that aggravates a crime or makes it greater than it was when committed. Every law that changes the punishment and inflicts a greater punishment than the law annexed to the crime when committed. And fourth, every law that alters the legal rules of evidence and receives less or different testimony than the law required at the time of the commission of the offense in order to convict the offender. And I believe they did all that. I think they overstepped this federal area in, in number one, every law that makes an action done before the passing of a law and which was innocent when done. Okay, so I don't know what laws are out there right now on the books that credits um, someone who has been uh, sentenced or not sentenced, but charged with a um, sex offense crime and then later and then been found not guilty and then later bring this up are they allowed to do that because i wonder what laws were on the books at that time so we would definitely have to do that number one go back in 2008 and look at the sexual uh, laws that he was charged with um, and then go and, and look at each one of those case laws and see if that individual, uh, law had changed in any way. And number two, every law that aggregates a crime or makes it greater than it was, which the docuseries definitely did. Um, they made it more than what it was without evidentiary evidence. And, um, so that is an example of that And every law that changes the punishment and inflicts a greater punishment. See, I mean, this is what I'm saying. When you have adults and these adults are consenting or parents are giving consent, then at this particular time, this is why people are saying, um, go after the parents. Because in this law, according to the federal government, every law that changes punishment and inflicts a greater punishment than the law extended to the crime when it was committed that is something that should be taken in consideration and Lewin Weber should definitely look at that. If not, that's going to be a, a conflict. It's going to be a, a conflict. And then every law that alters the legal rules of evidence. And you, we all know that it's uh, judge and Donnelly overstepped a lot of boundaries and, um, in the legal rule of evidence. Did she follow the legal rule of evidence or did she follow her emotion and um, receive less or different testimony than the law required at the time of the commission of the offense in order to convict the offender? I believe she definitely did that. And only the appeal, once it's open, um, judge, judge, uh, I mean, not judge, but attorney, 
Jennifer Bonjean, she knows all this stuff. She recognizes it. I don't know every single law. And she has a whole legal team that is going to go in and search all the all the case law that was affiliated and associated and get that mandatory rule from that particular law to determine if they followed, if the courts, the lower courts followed it. And the circuit court of appeal is doing even more. It's going to expand that even greater. So it gives us more of a in tune terminology behind the, uh, quote, statute of limitations. So let's go a little deeper. Now the due process is, uh, the court later made clear that due process contemplates more than a claimant showing of adverse impact caused by a pre indictment delay. Okay. So that doesn't affect him. Um, let's look at some of the attachments here. So they have some laws and some rules that is uh, very effective. Um, and you get more time, you get 20 years literally for under the USC code uh, 18 USC.668 for major art theft. I mean, you get 20 years for just stealing somebody's artwork. Like, really? Okay, let me see here. And so it goes on and on. It, it 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 goes into the rules of like in the state. So let's see what New York says. New York, five years, anytime class A felony or first, okay, first degree rape, sexual criminal act or sexual conduct against a child, New York criminal law, section 30.10. Okay, so that's really enough. For that, but now I'm going to get into the area of um, sentencing. I might as well make this one video because <clears throat> it just makes sense. It just makes sense. You know what I mean? Get it all done. Get it out the way. Um, because I'm waiting on the appeal portion of um, of what was. what is going to be filed and that should be coming up very 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 soon so i don't want you to get this mixed up as to this is what's happening now this is already taking place this is done um let me see here all right so the sentencing Um, and Donley. Okay, I think this is outdated. Let me close out and go back. Um, yeah, so, so there's a lot that takes place within the statute of limitations, rules and guidelines and procedures. And I don't believe every judge knows all the rules because the rules are put on the books as the individual um, creates precedence. So like, for instance, if uh, um, Robert Sylvester Kelly decided not to file an appeal, then his sentencing would go under precedence. And in that, um, in that area, he will at that point, um, well, I have this on this video. He will at that point, um, be looked at as precedent. So that law that went ahead of him will be used against him. You know what I mean? To, to say that this is what it was. So, um, let me get this information out here. All right. So in the U S district court, um, U.S. of America versus Robert Sylvester Kelly. Judgment in a criminal case, case number 119CR00286, AMD1, USM number 0962735. Jennifer Bonjean was retained and 
He was found guilty on counts after a plea of not guilty. Um, counts one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so under the title section 18 USC 1962C, racketeering was the nature of the offense, and the offense ended on 6 3 2019. So they gave him one count. And 18 USC 242 1, the Man Act transportating transportation of Jane Doe 5. It was offense ended 10 30, 2015. He, re, he received two counts on that. So let me go. So yeah, he was found guilty and she signed off on it. So the, um, the defendant is sentenced as provided in pages two through eight of this judgment. The sentence is imposed pursuant to the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984. I hope she took in consideration his Disability Act because the Sentencing Reform Act includes that disability um, component piece in it. And it was signed and filed, well, it was signed on 6-29-2022. Additional counts of conviction. We're going to go over that now. Defendant Robert Sylvester Kelly, case number 119-CR-00286-AMD1. AMD1. Additional counts of conviction, judgment page two of eight. Man Act coercion and enticement of Jane Doe number five, offense ended 10 30, 2015, three counts. Man Act coercion of minor Jane Doe five, 10 30, 2015, four counts. Man Act transportation of minor Jane Doe five, 10 30, 2015, five counts. Man Act Transportation, Jane Doe 6, 518, 2017, 6 counts. Man Act Coercion and Enticement, Jane Doe 6, 518, 27, 7 counts. Man Act Transportation, Jane Doe 6, February 2nd, 2018, 8 counts. Man Act Coercion and Enticement, Jane Doe 6, February 2nd, 2018, 9 counts. Hmm. Defending Robert Sylvester Kelly and page three of eight in his sentencing um, report. And it says imprisonment. The defendant is hereby committed to the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons to be imprisoned for a total term of 360 months on count one, 10 years on counts two, six, and eight, 20 years on counts three, four, five, seven, and nine. All counts to run concurrently. Now remember back in the day, we talked about consecutively and concurrently. Um, so I told you that there is um, the way that they look at concurrent sentencing. So let's see what that is. So concurrently, a concurrently, a concurrent sentence refers to a type of sentence judges are able to give defendants convicted of more than one crime. Instead of serving each sentence one after another and concurrent sentences, a concurrent sentence allows the defendant to serve all their sentences at the same time where the longest period of time is controlling. So that means that he's, he's service, he's serving all of them together. So that was a good thing. That's why he didn't get, quote, life because it wasn't consecutive where he would do um, first, he would do six, 60 months. Once he's done serving that, then he'll start his 10 year count, um, sentence. And then after that, he'll start his 20 year sentence. So basically they summed it all up as in 30 sentence, uh, 30 years and then gave him credit for the, the years that he's been in so far.
Okay, supervised release. Upon release from imprisonment, you will be on supervised release for a term of five years. Now, this is where it's going to get a little tricky for him because of the fact that once he serves his time, even if he's on, um, if he receives a new trial or gets acquitted, um, because of the fact the situations with the um, allegations of sexual offenders, I believe that that would be probably put into the um, into the sentencing or into the request mandated by the court that they follow this. So mandatory conditions, I'm going to read all of them, but I'm going to read the one that um, the courts that Judge Donnelly has defined him to to cooperate with. And um, so you must not commit another federal, state or local crime. Two, you must not unlawfully possess a controlled substance. Three, you must refrain from any unlawful use of a controlled substance. You must submit to one drug test within 15 days of release from imprisonment and at least two periodic drug tests thereafter as determined by the court. So under three, he was one, two, and three, he was fine. Four, you must make restitution in accordance with 18 USC or any other statute authorizing a sentence of restitution. And it says check if applicable, so it's unchecked. So I believe that he will probably have to do one through three. And then the check boxes after three is uh, number five. You must cooperate in the collection of DNA as directed by the probation officer. Uh, check if applicable. So that is what she's requesting, collection of DNA. And then, of course, number six, you must comply with the requirements of Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act as directed by the probation officer. That went unchecked. And number seven, you must participate in an approved program for domestic violence. That was unchecked. So you must comply with the standard conditions that have been adopted by this court as well as with any other conditions of the attached page. So let's keep looking. Standard conditions of supervision, page judgment entry five of eight. Um, as part of your supervised release, you must comply with the following standard conditions of supervision. These conditions are imposed because they establish the basic expectations for your behavior while on supervision and identify the minimum tools needed by probation officers to keep informed, to report to the court about and bring about improvements in your conduct and condition. You must report to the probation officer in the federal judicial district where you are authorized to reside within 72 hours from your release from in prison. Unless the probation officer instructs you to report to a different probation officer or within a different time frame. So this is very important. Like once he gets out, like I said, he's going to be older. He's already confused about everything that has happened. Somebody's going to have to help him get this part of his life together. They're going to, he's going to need a schedule or a planner um, because that's going to be very difficult to remember how, you know, to go drop, to go really uh, get a DNA testing. And sometimes the probation officer, I'm not saying that they do it on purpose, but a lot of times they don't get the information to you till a day later and then tell you, oh, you didn't report. So now you have a point against you. You know, um, number two, after initially reporting to the probation office, you will receive instructions from the court or the probation officer about how and when you must report to the probation officer and you must report to the probation officer as instructed. So I hope his probation officer actually works with him during this time when he is released because of the fact that he is going to need that help. I mean, He's never been here before. So um, that's definite. Um, so his probation officer should become his best friend, you know, when it comes down to where he needs to be and when he needs to be there. Number four, you must answer truthfully the questions about asked by your probation officer. Number five, you must live at a place approved by the probation officer. If you plan to change 
where you live, or anything about your living arrangements, such as the people you live with, you must notify the probation officer at least 10 days before the change. If notifying the probation officer in advance is not possible due to unanticipated circumstances, you must notify the probation officer within 72 hours of becoming aware of the change or expected change. So yeah, they're going to have to know everything about you at this point. You must allow the probation officer to visit you at any time at your home or elsewhere, and you must permit the probation officer to take any items prohibited by the conditions of your supervision that he or she approves in plain view. Number seven, you must work full time at least 30 hours per week at a lawful type of employment unless the probation officer excuses you from doing so. If you do not have a full time employment, you must try to find full time employment unless the probation officer excuses you from doing so. If you plan to change where you work or anything about your work, such as your position or your job responsibilities, you must notify the probation officer at least 10 days before the change. If notifying the probation officer at least 10 days in advance is not possible due to unanticipated circumstances, you must notify them within 72 hours of becoming aware of the situation. So this is important because any violation of these rules, and believe me, they're going to hold him to extreme um, accountability and, you know, Number seven. Oh, and as far as working, you know what I'm saying? They made the remark. Someone made the remark on some CBS show when they said that he'll be um, singing on the L again under, you know, the subway. That'll never happen. That'll never happen. Um, number seven, you must work full time at least 30 hours a week at a lawful type of employment. OK, we did that. Um, you must not communicate or interact with someone, you know, is engaged in criminal activity. And that's where I'm grateful that the stipulations of the rules are there. And it's like even if he gets acquitted, he needs to follow these rules to the T because this is what's going to help him save his life, even if he doesn't have to report to anyone. He should still, you know what I'm saying? He should still you know, make himself in plain sight, keep himself in plain sight. If you know someone has been convicted of a felony, you must not knowingly communicate or interact with that person without first getting the permission of the probation officer. Okay, so the probation officer more or less is saying here that, hey, look, we want to keep you safe in certain circumstances. I know certain circumstances is all about control, but we want to keep you safe so the goal here is to make sure that you um, don't hang around people that's going to take you back to prison. You know, um, if you're arrested or questioned by a law enforcement officer, you must notify the probation officer within 72 hours. And that was one of my um, areas when I was released. I was on probation for I, or parole. I think it was like five years, but then. I was released in like two because um, every time I had an issue or run in, I mean, I got into a car accident that wasn't even my fault, but I ended up contacting my parole officer, letting him know, hey, listen, I made contact with the law and that's all they want. And then they're like, OK, um, send over the information, get the ins you know information from the insurance company, because what could have happened is it could have been my phone and I could have been drinking and driving or whatever. And that could have affected it, you know, against me. But because I was clean, I was doing what I needed to do. And just because I reported when I had to um call the police on someone that was close to me that I felt needed support and help. I reported that, that I did make contact and this is what I did. And this is who I called. And, you know, I was just all very open and transparent and you have to be that way. Okay. Um, because when they find something, they're going to be like, Oh, you didn't tell me this. So that means you didn't tell me other things. And then they go into this whole spiral of investigations. You know what I mean? 
Number 10, you must not own, possess, or have access to firearm, ammunition, destructive device, or dangerous weapon, anything that was designed or was modified for the specific person, purpose of causing bodily injury or death to another person, such as nunchucks or tasers. So you, at this point, they're trying to say that people must be just victims, especially in a society that we live in right now. You can't even go to a 4th of July uh, parade without something happening and everybody else is armed and ready for combat. And you just because, see, I think they need to revamp that <laughs> right there, especially for people who are not violent or who may have, you know, just, I don't know, that needs to be reconsidered for the 21st century. Number 11, you must not act or make any agreement with a law enforcement agency to act as a confidential human source or informant without first giving the permission of the court. Number 12, if the, if the probation officer determines based on your criminal record, personal history and characteristics of the nature and circumstance of your offense, you pose a risk to another person, including an organization, the probation officer with prior approval of the court may require you to notify the person about the risk and you must comply with that instruction. The probation officer may contact the person and confirm that you have noticed, notified the person about the risk. 13. You must follow the instructions of the probation officer related to the conditions of the supervision. U.S. Probation Office use only okay. So before we go over restitution, I want to talk about special conditions of supervision um, on the judgment entry. And it says the defendant shall comply with any applicable, applicable state or federal sex offender registration requirements as instructed by the probation officer, the Bureau of Prisons, or any state offender registration agency in the state where he resides, work, or as a student. Number two, the defendant shall participate in mental health treatment program, which may include participation in a treatment program for sex disorders as approved by the U.S. Probation Department. The defendant shall contribute to the cost of such services rendered and or any psychotropic medications prescribed to the degree he is reasonably able and shall come cooperate in securing any applicable third-party payment. The defendant shall disclose all financial information and documents to the probation department to access his ability to pay. As part of the treatment program for sexual offenders, the defendant shall participate in polygraph exams and or visual response testing in a, to obtain information necessary for risk management and correctional treatment. <clears throat> Number three. The defendant shall not associate with or have any contact with convicted sex offenders unless in a therapeutic setting with the permission of the U.S. Department of Probation. Four, the defendant shall not associate with children under the age of 18 unless a responsible adult is present and he has a prior approval from the probation department. Prior approval does not apply to contacts which are not known in advance by the defendant where children are accompanied by a parent or guardian and for incidental contacts in public settings. Any such non-pre-approved contacts with children must be reported to probation department as soon as possible, but no later than or no later than 12 hours. Upon commencing supervision, the defendant shall provide the probation department the identity and contact information regarding any family members or friends with children under the age of 18. When the defendant expects to have routine contact with so that the parent or guardians of these children may be contacted and the probation department can approve routine family and social interactions such as holidays and other family gatherings where such children are present and supervision by parents and guardian without individual approval of each, each event. Number five, if the defendant cohabitates with an individual who has minor children, the defendant will inform that other party of his prior criminal history concerning his sex offense. Moreover, he will notify the party of his pro prohibition of associating with any children under the age of 18 unless a responsible adult is present. Number six, the defendant shall report to the probation department any and all electronic communication service accounts. 
used for users communication, dissemination, and or storage of di digital media files, audio, video images. This includes but is not limited to email accounts, social media accounts, and cloud storage accounts. The defendant shall provide each account identifier and password and shall report the creation of new accounts. Charges and identifiers and passwords, transfer, suspension, and or deletion of any account within five days of such action. Failure to provide uh, accurate account information may be grounds for revoking of release. The defendant shall permit the probation department to assess and search any accounts using defendant's credentials pursuant to this condition only when reasonably suspicion exists and the defendant has violated a condition of his supervision in that account to is to be searched containing evidence of the violation failure to submit to such a, a search may be grounds for revoking of release so this is the technology laws that i was telling you was going into effect I guarantee you that these laws have been in effect since uh, Judge Ann Donnelly decided to um, to actually deal with the case, the sentencing part. I bet you these are new laws here. Number seven, the def defendant shall submit his person property, house, residence, vehicle, papers, computers, other electronic communications or data, storage devices or media or office to a search conducted by the U.S. probation officer. Failure to submit a search may be grounds for a revoking of release. The defendant shall warn any other occupants of the premises may be subject to this condition. An officer may conduct a search pursuant to the condition only when reasonably suspicion uh, exists that the defendant has violated a condition of his supervision and that the areas to be searched contain evidence of this violation. Any search must be conducted as a reasonable time and in a reasonable manner. Number eight, the defendant is not to use a computer, internet capable device or similar electronic device to access any visual depictions including any photography, film, video, picture, generated image, picture, whether made or produced by electronic, mechanical, or other means of sexual explicit conduct. The defendant shall also not use a computer, internet, capable device, or similar device to view images of naked children. The defendant shall not use his computer to view sexually explicit conduct or visual depictions of naked children stored on related computer media such as CDs, DVDs, and shall not communicate via his computer with any individual or group who promotes the sexual abuse of children. The defendant shall cooperate with the U.S. probation officers, computer, and internet management monitor program. Cooperation shall include but not be limited to identifying computer systems, internet capable devices, and any electronic media capable of storing data the defendant has access to, allowing an initial examination of the device and installation of monitoring software hardware to the device at defendant's expense. So they're about to put all this into motion. So the monitoring software hardware is authorized to capture and analyze all data contained on the device, including geolocation of the device. So they're going to be he's going to have a forever tracking device upon him or as long as he's um, on parole or probation. The probation office may access the device and or data captured by the monitoring software at any time without suspicion that the defendant was has violated the condition of supervision. So he can be going to the grocery store and they're going to be stocking him. The defendant may be limited to possessing only one personal internet capable device to facilitate the device and any electronic media capable of data storage for further analysis by law enforcement of the probation office based upon reasonable suspicion that any computer system, internet capable device, any electronic media capable of data storage may result in adverse action as a sanction or a revocation. The defendant shall inform all parties that access a monitor device that the device is subject to search and monitoring. So anyone who's around him, so you know, that's going to be difficult because you never know who has what on their cell phones and people with cell phones will be around them. This is 
really, really insane. Number nine, the defendant shall refrain from contacting the victims of the offense. Okay. This means that he shall not attempt to meet in person, communicate by letter, telephone, email, the internet, or third party without the knowledge and permission of probation department. Does this include Joycelyn Savage? Because he was in a relationship with her. And if they include her into this um, sentencing, then he won't be able to see her as well. Number 10, upon request, the defendant shall provide the U.S. Probation Department with full disclosure of his financial records, including commingling income, expenses, assets, liabilities, to include yearly income tax returns, with the ex exception of the financial accounts reported and noted within the pre-sentence pre report. The defendant is prohibited from maintaining or opening any additional individual joint checking, savings, or other financial accounts for either personal or business purposes without the knowledge and approval of the U.S. Probation Department. The defendant shall cooperate with the probation officer in the investigation of either financial dealings and shall provide truthful monthly statements of their income and expenses. The defendant shall cooperate in the signing of any necessary authorization to release information forms permitting the U.S. Probation Department Department access to their final financial information and records. Well, damn, he might as well just get on medical or not Medicaid. Um, what's that? Might as well get on welfare. You know, this is super exceeding into his private life. Like, and I do get it that the more money you have, the more av availability you are to get what it is you want. But God, this is over. This is far. 11. The defendant shall comply with any possible restitution orders. Whoo, that was a lot. That was a lot. So let's move on to the restitution, guys. Come on. All right. So it's talking about the US court.gov. He has to report to that um, site. Now let's go into restitution. Criminal monetary penalties. The defendant must pay the total criminal monetary penalty under the schedule of payments on sheet six. Totals. Assessment. $900. Fine. $100,000. JVTA assessments. $40,000. The, term, the determination of restitution is deferred until 9-28-2022. An amended judgment in a criminal case will be entered after such determination. So I'm thinking that they're going to add um, to see what's going to go on with the other trial um, in Chicago. But yeah, that's that's excessive. There is going to be a lump sum payment of $900 due immediately balance is due schedule of payment hmm. and finally payment shall be applied in the following orders so there is going to be an assessment fee a restitutional principal so that means that they're going to make money and in interest off of the money that if you can't pay it all at one time going to be a restitutional principal and a restitutional interest, an AVAA assessment, fine principal, so there's going to be money attached to that, fine interest, community restitution, JVTA assessment, penalties, and cost, including cost of prosecution and court costs. So basically, they're trying to just futuristically Assume where his money is going to be spent, no matter who helps him pay to get out of this, you know, um, these fines, they're just taking all the money. They're taking everything. And I don't know if they're, you know, looking at the royalty um, opportunities that he could be afforded um, from his music. I hear that his music is streaming higher than normal after the sentencing um, was submitted on the docket as of June 30th by Judge Ann Donnelly and signed and, and, and posted on the docket. But I mean, there's a lot to this thing here, a whole lot. And as far as them opening up the statute of limitations, I feel that 
you know, um, they could be, again, overreaching the boundaries of um, what they are allowed to do in this case. I mean, I'm not sure. I really don't know, but I would like to see, and, and time will tell, and eventually I will go in and look at the statute of limitations and and you know what what is on the record and on the docket from 2008 uh let me see here there was something else i wanted to tell you um yeah so Judge um, Lewin Weber, I want to say, I'm about to find out here, he did deny the motion to, yeah, conclusions for the reasons stated therein, motion to dismiss and Kelly's motion to serve or deny. Um, what they're talking about, it says Kelly's motion to serve does not specifically exactly show why he will be prejudiced if all the counts are tried together. So basically, Kelly is saying that, you know, if you try me against all of this stuff, I'm not going to be able to, you know, be able to win at all. You're tying my hands in every area. Kelly does not adequately explain his assertion that the evidence in support of counts one through three is stronger than the evidence in support of counts 10 through 13. Kelly claims that the video evidence is much stronger than testimonial evidence of questionable veracity. So it's looking at the truth in the matter. Um, and he's saying that if you put the video out there, um, you know, it, it may not show the truth in all matters. I don't know. I've never seen the videos. Um, so I can't attest to that whether or not just to say that I believe, um, I don't know. You know, someone said, are you on the fence? Are you for him or against him? And my thing is, it's not your business. It's you have an opinion. I have an opinion. And one thing I'm not going to do is sit here and say that, you know, um, a human being is 100%. I'm not putting my name on my own kids that I guarantee that this person will not do this or this person will not do that. I guarantee that. I cannot put a guarantee on anybody's human experience. I can't do that. But what I can do is say that I know that the court system is completely unfair and unjust in the way that they're presenting the information because they're not putting the defense um, areas of, of question into play regarding the um, the trials or the sentencing or the none of that. So Kelly's motions asserts that severance is warranted, but does not provide specific evidence in support of that assertion. For that reason, the court denies Kelly's motion to server. So he didn't put enough information into why and how, you know, but I guess they know what they're doing because Bonjean don't want to. She just want to give the basics because they can take everything that is said and run with it. So she just wants to conclude, bam. This, all of this in the docket represents this one sentence. Server, you, you know, I want to have a separate um, court hearing regarding, you know, my case against Daryl McDavid and June Brown. I want to have my own separate case. Um, Kelly alleges that the evidence in support of counts one through three is stronger and the evidence in support's uh, 10 through 13. In support of his argument, Kelly states that counts one through three are sub supported by video evidence, but that was back in the day. Okay, I just read that. Um, Kelly argues that the counts should be severed from the rest of the indictment because he will suffer substantial prejudice otherwise. Severance may be warranted if a defendant is improperly coerced into testifying about a count on which he wishes to remain silent. Mm-hmm. So he definitely has that right to remain silent. Um, when a defendant seeks to serve charges because he wants to testify to some charges but not others, he must show that he has a strong need to testify on one count but not the others. Okay. Let me see here. 
Kelly next argues that McDavid's lawyers, Vadim Glosman, may have a conflict of interest. Kelly retained a lawyer named Ed Jensen to represent him in a criminal case, resulting in Kelly's acquittal in 2008. Between 8 and 2018, Kelly frequently consulted with Jensen. Glosman was an associate at Jensen's firm from 2014 to 2018. Kelly argues that through this connection, Glosman may have privileged information that could be used to Kelly's detriment. Glosman denies that he has any privileged information about Kelly. The 6122 hearing um, docket number 206, Glosman stated that his only conversation with Kelly and the first time he met Kelly was at Kelly's indictment hearing for this case. ID number 29, 14 through 15, 30, 23 through 24. Kelly does not identify any privileged information or any class of privileged information that he alleges Glosman assessed. Kelly submitted a declaration of his own on his own behalf where he states that he does not have a specific memory of ever consulting with Vladim Vadim Glosman. All Kelly offers is that he has a distinct memory of Glosman's name as someone who worked with Mr. Jensen. Kelly has not presented sufficient information to show that Glosman has an actual conflict of interest. The court will not sever McDavid and Kelly's trial, so they're going to stay together. Okay, as presented, Kelly's motion reads as blaming shift. Blame shifting among co-defendants does not mandate severance. Moreover, Kelly does not specifically exactly specify exactly what evidence he expects to present that will compromise any of McDavid's trial rights, nor does he specify what evidence he expected McDavid to present that will be used against him. The motion does not re raise any serious risks of impending defendant's trial rights or that a jury would be prevented from making a reliable judgment. Okay, serving defendant McDavid. Defendant Kelly argues that defendant McDavid should be tried separately because of the antagonistic defenses and because one of McDavid's lawyers may be a potential conflict of interest. So that was his um, motion to sever. Defendant Kelly has also filed a motion to sever. Kelly requests that defendant McDavid be tried separately and that counts 10 through 13 be severed from the rest of the indictment. Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 14 authorizes district courts to order separate trials or in counts, serve the defendant's trials, or provide any other relief that justice requires. This is the um, Federal Crime P14. District courts have discretion to grant the relief they deem proper, whether that is severance or something else district, such as a limited instruction. In cases... <clears throat> In cases involving conflicting defense service is not required, even if procedure to a defendant is shown. A court must only grant severance if there is a serious risk that a joint trial would compromise or spe a specific trial right of one of the defendants or prevent the jury from making a reliable judgment of guilt or innocence. Mm. That's strange. Okay, counts 9 through 13 of the indictment charge defendant with knowingly enticing minors to engage in sexual activity, activity. Counts 9, 10, 12, and 13 charges defendant with aggravated criminal sexual abuse in violation of 702. The indictment states that the activity occurred between 96 and 2001, like with charges 1 through 4, uh, provides the relevant statute of limitations at the time of the accused conduct. The limitation period expired when the minor turned 25 years of age. The earliest date at which any minor in the accused conduct turned 25 was August 2005, as discussed earlier, was amended in 2003, extending the limitations period to the life of the child. Earlier in this order, the court analyzed the applicability of the amended version of 18 U.S.C., 3283 to counts 1 through 4 of the indictment. The analysis for counts 9 through 13 is largely the same. Applying the first step of the Landgraf test, the court finds that it does not 
explicitly prescribe its proper reach. In the second step of Landgraf, the court applies Gibson. Defending Kelly's rights are not infringed because 3284 was twice amended before the previous limitations prior period for counts 9 through 13 expired. So again, it goes back to that whole statute of limitations I read about earlier. So like I was saying earlier, I don't know if there were laws that were placed on the books that from within his trial from 2008 or after that would have made, um, which would have allowed to open up the statute of limitation even after the statute of limitation had expired. So, yeah. So, okay, count six through eight. Um, six charges, all defendants were conspiring to receive child pornography and uh, the indictment states that the conspiracy took place between 2001 and 2007. Count seven charges, defendants Kelly and McDavid with receiving two videos of child pornography in violation of 18 USC and the indictment. Okay, let's go before that, before I continue. Didn't CNN receive child pornography as well? Didn't Suntime make 50 copies of the, okay, Jim Derek God has said it himself. He made 50 copies of the video and he um, had people watch the video when Sparkle had sent him the tape. So, um, or the anonymous person, excuse me, allegedly, the anonymous person has sent him the video. So that means that um, all these people received child pornography tapes. They all did. Just like David and Kelly received two videos of child pornography. Everyone else did. Everyone else did. I'm just saying. Um, that's weird. The indictment alleges that Kelly and McDavid received these tapes in August 2001. Count eight charges defendants Kelly and McDavid were receiving one video of child pornography in violation of USC, 18 USC 225-2A. Um, and the, the indictment states that Kelly and McDavid received this video in April 2007. Defendants argue that counts six through eight are subject to the general five-year statute of limitations and are now untimely, stating that unless otherwise provided by the law, the statute of limitations for a non-capital offense, we just read that, okay? We just read that, um, uh, uh, argues that the, um, let me see. Statute of limitations for a non-capital offense is five years. The government argues that the court should apply the statute of limitations set forth in 18 U.S.C. 3299. According to U.S.C. 3299, there is no statute of limitations for an offense under Chapter 110 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code. Counts 6 through 8 all charged defendants with violations of 2252, which fall under Chapter 1. 10 of title 18 and such applies to counts six through eight so they have the authority to do so and they still denied it um however you know this is something that again he may receive but who knows um what appeal they're going to use for this as well counts one through four Counts one through four, the indictment charges defendant Kelly with producing four videos of a minor engaged in sexually explicit conduct in violation of 18 U.S.C. 2251A. The indictment states that the videos were produced from 98 to 99. At the time of the charge conduct, the statute of limitations expired once the minor reached the age of 25, amended in 2006. Kelly argues that as a result, these counts are time barred. In response, the government argues that the limitations period was extended when the statute was amended and the extended date should apply. Okay, so I guess it was like being grandfathered in to a uh, a time that was approved earlier. Yeah, uh, the extended date should apply. 18 U.S.C. 3283 was amended in 2003, extending the statute of limitations to the life of the minor. That's what happened in 2003. But 
the filing was in 19, the statute was different in 98 and 99. So when it hit 2003, then yeah, it could have changed. Um, it could have been amended. It was amended, but um, in 2006. So the statute of limitations didn't hit him at that time. So the rulings are going to be probably null and void because of the fact that the statute was amended in 2006. So, and that extended from 2006, the law is that if you mess with a minor now from 2006 until today, the statute of limitations is for the lifetime of that child or 10 years after the offense, whichever comes, whichever is longer. Now, in 18 U.S.C. 3283, if the operative limitations period is the one set out in 94 version of the statute, counts one through four expired in 2009. If the amended statute of limitations applies, the counts are timely brought. The Supreme Court has set out a two-step test to decide whether a federal statute applies to past conduct. Landgraf versus USI Film Products. The first step is the to determine whether Congress has expressly prescribed the statute's proper reach. If the statute's proper reach is clear, the inquiry ends there. However, if the statute is silent, the next step is to determine whether applying it retroactively would impair a party's rights. Defendants urge the court to look to the legislative history of 18 U.S.C. Uh, 3283 and rule that Congress expressly prescribed that the statute does not apply retroactively. Defendants point to the House version of the bill, which contained an express retroactively provision. Child Abduction Prevention Act, the final version of the bill omitted this provision, and Senator Lay confirmed that the omission was intentional. Senator Lay Amber Legislation Congress recorded 149 um, 50 in 2003, Judge Nathan of the Southern District of New York recently dealt with this precise issue in the prosecution of defendant Ghislaine Maxwell, United States versus Maxwell, 534 F Supreme F Sup S U P P dot 3D 299. In 2021, their judge, Nathan, analyzed 18 U.S.C. 3283, finding that the Congress not only permitted, but intended to allow prosecutions for past conduct for which the statute of limitations has not expired. The court agrees with Judge Nathan's analysis with each amendment to 18 U.S.C. 3283, the statute of limitations increased. In light of the lack of retroactivity provision, but steadily increasing statutes of limitations, the court finds that the statute does not prescribe its proper reach. And there again, if they ignore that, if they ignore that, it's going to be a future problem for them. The court next moves to the step two of Landgraf test. The court finds that applying the court version of 18 USC would not impair the defendant's right in the Seventh Circuit applying procedural statutes. which effectively enlarged the limitations period and does not violate the ex post facto clause so long as the statute is passed before the given prosecution is barred. U.S. versus Gibson, we talked about that as well. However, their motion to dismiss defendants urge this court to read the second step of Landcraft as providing broader protections for criminal defendants that the ex post facto clause Emphasizing in emphasizes in its originality, the court declines to do so. Applying the current version of 18 U.S.C. 3283 does not impair any of the defendant's rights because the statute was amended before the original limitations period expired. This court will not disturb well-settled law to create new statutory rights where none currently exist. Counts one through four are timely. So. You know, they're they're doing this here was an order uh, filed June 30th, 2022 in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, uh, Eastern District, U.S. of America, plaintiff 
versus uh, Robert Sylvester Kelly, a.k.a. R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid, and Milton Brown, a.k.a. June Brown. Case number 19, CR 567, under Judge Harry Lewin Weber. And the order before the court is defendant's motion to dismiss counts 1 through 4 and counts 6 through 13 of the superseding indictment. Also before the court is defendant's Kelly's motion to serve her for the reasons stated herein, the motions are denied. So, again, this is what we're dealing with. Um, and I just feel I, I this is going to be... This is going to be amazing to see how, you know, the courts will allow themselves to do what they want in the case in order to create whatever laws they want to create in areas that They choose to create for themselves. So that's the sentencing and the statute of limitations um, excerpt that was done to give you a little more understanding of what the statute of limitations is all about. And also the sentencing report from Judge Ann Donnelly. I put it all together. So then that way, you know, hey, it's all there. It's all there. Um, I thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. And, you know, this appeal is going to be very interesting uh, to see how it all goes down with uh, Attorney Bonjean. And um, I hope that she has the power to withstand everything that's going on and be able to you know, move on behalf of Robert Sylvester Kelly, even after all of the chaos, all of the chaos that has exalted this case. But I pray that Robert, you're staying strong. I pray that everything that is going up against you, if you are innocent and you know in your heart you are innocent, may it all come to fruition for you. And, um, I'm here for you. I'm definitely here for you. Um, and it's not about being one sided or, you know, the truth will prevail. Time will bring truth no matter what the situation is. And that's how I choose to put it. Um, I stand for Robert Sylvester Kelly and his innocence. I do believe that, you know, sometimes when you have to look at the law from a certain perspective, you cannot incorporate emotion into into the reality of the, the situation, you know what I mean? So to be asked, you know, to hold back those videos to me, um, it's, it's questionable why, if you're not in the video, um, but then too, it's not because like I said, in past videos, I think a couple videos ago, I said, the way that green screens and filters and different things can analyze information, especially during video recording times. I mean, people were trying all new technology and DVDs and all of that was already out in some areas where we were just getting the VHSs. So, and CDs were out, you know, um, when we were just getting them, USB ports were out to where you could just like stream things, you know, they were talking about streaming. Aaliyah was talking about streaming herself and that was in the nineties. So at what point do we take time frames and timelines with technology and put a man's life into a, a box, you know, and that's where I, I choose to go the route of Robert Sylvester Kelly, no matter what's on the video cameras, but I have to prove that to myself, but I have to analyze what I'm hearing and then be able to dissect that from my own way that I process information. So nobody has a right to judge me as I have no right to judge anyone else. I don't care what anybody else thinks about him, whether they're for him or against him. That's their issue. See, and that's the thing. We need to stay focused on what we believe, what we know, 
you know, and, and, and knowing is greater than believing. So you just handle your lane. You stay in your lane and you do your thing. You know what I'm saying? But other than that, you know, everybody has a right to their opinion. Everybody has a right to, you know, voice their opinion, but just make sure it's on a platform that is going to validate and agree with that opinion. I mean, why would someone over in Kelly, you know, dislike come over to Kelly Nation? You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, you know, we ain't got no beef. You stay over there. I stay over here. This is, you know, it's not turf. It's just my independent way of looking at life and why I choose to believe what I do and what I do on my podcast is my business. And also, please do not introduce me to anyone. If I don't already know them, I'm not trying to give free advertisement for somebody to go over to somebody else's channel. So please stop disrespecting the flow. You know what I'm saying? Just don't don't do that. Because if I feel that I want to co co connect and work with a group of people, I'm going to do it. But I'm a leader, honey. I am a, I am a straight up leader. And that's what this thing is about. Being a leader, making your own decisions, doing your own things and, you know, handling your own business. And with that, thank you for liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing to this podcast. I greatly appreciate every subscription, every view. Um, you're wonderful. I'm going to be going on Patreon in a little. So I will keep all of my subscribers in the know um, so that you will be able to join me and we can have our private conversations where there are certain things that we cannot post here on YouTube because of their guidelines. But we'll be able to do it, um, provide more information over at Patreon. OK, peace and blessings. And we'll see you next time. And as always. Keep it 100.